We know that plants make people happy, but in my opinion, plants make people kind and compassionate as well. Think about it. We spend our time, our free time and expendable income caring for plants that can't communicate with us. At least a dog can bark at us when it's hungry. Knitting needles don't wilt, right? And yet we show up to this hobby with curiosity and joy and plants are a part of why and how we do that. I am so excited to have longtime plant friend Brittany Gowan on the pod to discuss why plants can be our greatest wellness tools. Welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care. my sweet plant friends. Welcome. If you're new here, I'm Maria, your new best plant friend, and I'm here to help you care for plants successfully and grow joy in your life by doing so. And if you're a repeat listener, welcome back. Welcome home. I'm so honored to be part of your planty journey. And I'm so excited to introduce you to one of my personal plant friends. She's been one of my OG plant friends. I've known her for almost seven years at this point, Brittany Gowan. She has an organizational and executive coaching certification. She has an MS in or, uh, organizational psychology, and she's really always approached plant care through the self-care and wellness lens. We have such a heart-opening, inspiring conversation today. Before we dive into it, I just wanted to say, if you like this plants and wellness element of you know caring for plants, you also might enjoy the YouTube video that I put out this week. That's three plant life parallels for imposter syndrome. So how you can use lessons from your plants to overcome imposter syndrome, which is something I think a lot of people struggle with, whether it's at your job, whether if it's with your friends, like you don't think you're cool enough to be in your friend group, or you don't think you deserve a raise. Some people struggle with it even in their families. So anyway, there's three really interesting plant life parallels waiting for you on the YouTubes if you partake. And if not, just make sure you're subscribed to this podcast because we're bringing you weekly free episodes full of educational insights, whether it's how to care for plants or episodes like today, which is how to use plants to live a happier life. And if you don't mind, find your favorite plant friend, whether they're an in real life plant friend or whether they are a online plant friend and send them this podcast or pick your favorite episode that you've listened to lately and send it to them and spread the love. Let's get this podcast in as many earbuds as possible. So this is such a beautiful conversation. I could have talked to Brittany for so much longer. She's such a dear friend. So without further ado, let's dive in. Here's Brittany. Brittany, welcome back to the podcast. And nice to catch up. <laughs> I know, Maria, this has been so nice. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, to catch up. It's been too long. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, the last time I had you on the podcast was our pause with plants episode. And it was like, right in the depths of the beginning of the pandemic. And we were in it in that episode. And I think about just how much has changed for both of us personally and professionally. And now we're both authors. And you know, we were you were one of my OG plant friends in New York City, which is so wild. I mean, it's crazy to think about those brunches that the girls used to have the NYC plant mamas. I know. And they were such fun times. They feel like not that long ago, even then, though, then you look at it, you're like, yeah, it was like many years ago, but yet like yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I guess like eight years ago. Yeah, it's wild. <laughs> yeah, like I, I know your planty journey. But for those listening who are getting introduced to you, you know, formerly, I have this thing with urban jungles now, Brittany Gowan. But can you tell us kind of your journey to the mindful plant lady author that you have become? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that in general, it started when I moved to New York over 15 years ago, which is crazy to say, but in that first apartment, I just had a few little succulents, but I also loved going like out into the parks or going to the community gardens. And it kind of all evolved organically with growing up with a lot of nature and greenery around me coming into the city. I think I just innately wanted that connection and it also helped me to release stress but yeah, over the years, like I had many plants in my apartment. I had a few plants in my apartment. And I think it just goes to show it's like 
stages of your life and how it works where you have more or less. And now I only have one huge monstera, but I love her so much. So, so yeah, it's been a journey like everything else and, and plants are a part of it. Yeah. And you are a therapist kind of performance coach. So what do you do? And I know that you've kind of blended nature into your practice in many different ways, but what is your, you know, day to day job where you're bringing this work to the people? Yeah, so I have a background in organizational psychology. I have a master's in that. I also went to NYU for executive coaching. So I've blended those and basically have created a program where it's both stress management, it's mindset and performance, and it allows people to mold best practices so they can achieve their personal and professional goals and also support their health. It also adds in a little bit of my sports background, as well as a nature focused element that brings in calm and connection. And that's really based on my experiences in New York City and learning how to release the stress of city life with plants and the natural world. So it's been rewarding. It continually changes with the clients and individuals I work with, which I'm also thankful for. And it's fun, I would say. <laughs> Yeah. So take me back to some of those experiences that kind of founded this mindful approach with plants for being in the city. You know, in your book, you write about how you used to work in the Chrysler building, which was pretty cool, pretty random fact I didn't know about you, and um, how hard that was and how nature ended up being this wellness tool for you. Can you kind of take us back? Definitely. So yeah, I worked in the Chrysler building, which I have always been an architecture fan. So besides being a nature lover, um, and the Chrysler building is my favorite building in the world. So getting to work in it at, right out of college was like a, a wow moment. But like I write in the book, like once you get up the elevator and you're out of the Art Deco lobby, it is just like rows of cubicles, tan walls. And I worked in a sales job that was pretty high stress. And I realized quite quickly that my lunch breaks, which were short, but they needed to be used to really restore my calm. And I started to go to Tudor City, which is right at the UN. So it's 42nd Street and First Avenue. And it wasn't that far from the Chrysler building, but it took a little bit to get there. And when I got there, there was only like a few other office workers that would be on the benches and, and walking around. And I realized quickly that this was going to be my place for calm, but it wasn't something that I really thought I was doing for calm in the moment. It was just like, okay, like I need to get out. I need to see something. I need some kind of greenery. And it started to make a big impact on going back to work and the afternoons when I was able to go to that little park. I felt more connected to myself, less stressed about what was going on. And those beginning moments really shaped how I connected with nature going forward. And definitely when I was in corporate jobs and in offices, I always found like a little piece of nature to go into when I could get a coffee or go to lunch. So it just became a way of life. And I think it also allowed me to stay here longer and also just get in the mindset that I can overcome any feelings that weren't serving me. Oh my gosh, I loved so many of the things that you said. And I'm curious, were you always connected to nature as a kid? I know you said that you grew up, you know, more rurally, but how did you even intuitively know that the park was going to be the place to restore? And, you know, had, because I feel like for a lot of people, like per personally, I didn't even know I was missing nature when I was disconnected from it. Like, was this an intuitive thing? Is this something that you've always been able to kind of lean on? I think it's definitely from my parents. I mean, growing up, they are plant and nature lovers and they had a million plants growing outside. And they also innately were interested in talking about nature. So like we'd be in the car or we'd be in the backyard like, oh, isn't that like an interesting shade of pink on that leaf? And I think that through their interest with nature and their understanding that it is um, something to connect to for health and well-being for themselves, that they, they did pass that on to my brother and I. And I think that we just grew up as a family, like noticing aspects of the natural world and seeing its value in that way. But and it just became like how we talked. So I think like coming to New York, though, I didn't think anything about that. It was like the city was, you know, the dream and like, and but I quickly realized that that calmness of nature 
still needed to be part of my life. Yeah, I got lucky with my parents being like that. But I think innately that they came to that as well. I feel like that's great parenting advice, you know, start them young and get your kids engaging with nature early on so that you can give them that opportunity for intuition. What are the different ways you engage with nature for people listening to the show that are living in an urban environment that's overcrowded or they're in the cubicle, you know, they don't have natural light, they don't have a view out of a window. What are some practices and suggestions that you would give to the urban city dweller like you and I used to be um, to kind of have those restorative moments? Yeah, I think that you have to get creative in the sense of like the little the little pockets of nature really become your respite. So if you go outside and like planters outside of big skyscrapers, or if you're in an area where some you can see some window boxes, there are a lot more li- like little pockets of nature than there there used to be. And and buildings I think do a nice job of having things outside, but you have to take time to actually observe and be present to it. So I think that those little things can be bigger things. I know that's been key for me. I also think that say you're in a building or you're working from home and you can't get outside, remembering a setting in nature that you love is something that I think is a great way to connect with the natural world. It's something I've done forever. And it's it's a practice that I use with most of my clients of visualizing yourself in nature. All the meditations that are in the book are based on that imaginative quality. And I think that when you do that, you can retrieve the calm of nature. So look for the little things and also use your mind. I think we always have access to those those things. I love this. This takes me back to like back in the day, Brittany, when you had a podcast called Pause with yeah. Plants. Do you do you still have that podcast? Do you still do that? I still have it. Someday I'll bring it back. But that whole idea of these short little brief things with nature, like I made it for city people when they're riding the subway to listen to a two minute meditation and be like, okay, common nature in the, in the craziness of all of this. So that has stayed with me just as taken different forms. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people listening should go, I used to listen to your show all the time. It's called pause Thanks. with plants. And it's these <laughs> tiny little meditations that are it was reminding me so much when I was reading your book, because you have all these written out meditations throughout your book, like poetry. But I was like, oh, my God, this is the next iteration of Brittany's Pause with Plant podcast, because I remember I'd be on the seven train listening to your, po- you know, you'd be taking us to like a tropical jungle. And I was like, take me, Brittany, take me away. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I appreciate that. I appreciate you remembering that. It's, it was one of my favorite things to do. And and that is the inspiration for the things I wrote out. Yeah. Oh, I love it. And also another thing that you, two other things that you mentioned, I want to bring attention to number one, I can't speak for every city, but I can definitely speak for New York City. And I'm going to, I'm going to guess most other large cities. There are so many smaller gardens that are so underutilized. Like, yeah, Central Park is great, but you probably have like a little pocket garden that's just like a private alcove from a building or a little tiny little community garden that no one is ever in. And once you can locate those gardens, and ideally get access to them, some you can walk right into sometimes you have to like apply and you know, get a membership or whatever. I mean, I feel like these cities have so many more green spaces than we think that they offer us. But then you do have to notice and you had a really interesting part of your book that was talking about noticing the small things. And if you're looking at a nature scape, how many little things can you see? And I was just at the Amazon Spheres last week. They have this like epic green wall that I think has 1200 plants on it. And I was having such a fun, you know, five minutes just going over the same, you know, couple of square feet, but trying to see how many different plants I could see. Because every time you went back to it, you'd see a different plant or you'd see a different bloom or you'd see a different aerial root popping out. So I don't think that's intuitive because a lot of us are running from schedules, appointments to appointments, to phone calls, to texts, to checking the Instagram, to doing the thing. Like, I think it's not intuitive for us to stop and notice the little things anymore. So can you kind of, can you talk about that, that particular practice in your book? Yeah, it is my favorite. And it's something that I started doing in the city. And it's something that I've worked with 
clients on for many years of just noticing, obviously, the, the little things. And if we're using nature as a tool for that, noticing the different shades of green on a specific leaf, and maybe it's the tiniest leaf, like really getting into the details. And this is a great practice of mindfulness, active presence, and also training your mind to be focused. And I think that comes back to my sports boat background of really having like linear focus on things and paying attention to specific aspects, I would say. And I think when you do that, I know from my own experience that whatever else is in your mind, whether it be good or something not as great, it goes to the side and your brain is a wonderful thing, but it only can focus on one thing at once. So if you're like, okay, well, there are kinds of shades of orange around this plant, like your mind can't be elsewhere. So it's one of my favorite practices of mindfulness and present moment awareness. And I think it's also has a childlike wonder to it an activity that I think everyone can get on board with because it's entertaining if you embrace and allow it to be. Plant friend, the magical feeling of hearing the deep resonance of a Wind River chime in your garden is honestly incomparable to anything else I've heard. And I know that sounds insane, but they're seriously the prettiest sounding chimes I've ever heard. And you hear them singing in the wind throughout the day. And it's like this constant reminder to drop into the present moment. Billy and I have two Wind River chimes. I have one outside of my office. Billy, we have one outside of our kitchen. Throughout the day, the wind blows. The chime represents that wind. And when I hear the chime, it's this reminder to like take a deep breath and drop into myself. It's so beautiful plant friend if you're looking for a new way to grow joy or mindful moments in your life i can't recommend a wind river chime enough for you for your home or your garden or both i love these chimes so much i've gone on a little bit of a gifting rampage with them i gifted my mother-in-law a set of wind chimes for christmas she loves wind chimes they went over so well and i also engraved the wind chime with her name on it so it was personalized which was a really nice touch And I love that whenever the chime rings, she's going to be able to think of me. It's such a beautiful and joyful gift. So join me in my gifting rampage and gift a Wind River chime to your loved one, whether it's for a birthday, an anniversary, a holiday, even maybe as remembering a lost loved one. And you should use code GROWINGJOY at windriverchimes.com to get a free engraving to add a special element to your gift. They come in a variety of colors, sizes, and sounds, so head to their website, windriverchimes.com, and don't forget to use code GROWINGJOY to receive a free engraving on all Corinthian Bells wind chimes. If you're looking for fun planty projects to do to lift your spirits or maybe even do with kids, I highly recommend the book Verdura, Living a Garden Life by Puerto Rican author and gardening celebrity Perla Sofia Curbelo Santiago. And she was a guest on the podcast a while back as well. Verdura celebrates the power of adding more green to your life with 30 simple and budget-friendly gardening projects that promote well-being through plants. Verdura means greenery in Spanish, but also refers to any edible plant from the garden. Throughout this book, Verdura is used as both a description and an aspiration. It's all about adding more verdura to your daily life. The 30 projects in this book will transform the initial spark of joy plants create into a healthy habit that enhances your life in so many ways. Get excited to learn how to create a container planting that appeals to the 13-year-old version of yourself, make a meditation garden or a private healing nook, plant a barefoot garden, or even learn to compile a gardentainment kit. Green up your life to reduce stress and add joy with help from Verdura by Perla Sofia Curbelo Santiago, available wherever books are sold. Go ahead and grab Verdura, Living a Garden Life at your local favorite bookstore, bookshop.org, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon.com. Oh, I love that so much. And that is the most accessible thing. You don't have to buy one thing to be able to do that practice. You can look outside your window. If you don't have a window, I could look at how many different grains of water in my desk or... My desk is in a low light area. So I just have this like little bowl of dried moss, like preserved moss in it. But I could easily just do that with like looking at all of the different fuzzy parts of the moss or it's the most accessible, simple practice that will 100% change your brain. Because I think I've, I've been reading too about how we have really lost our ability to monotask as a 
society because we're so used to doing so many things, multitask, to do so many things at once. And also we're celebrated for multitasking. We're not celebrated for monotasking. And it's gotten really hard just to do one thing. Most of us walk down the street and text and write an email and listen to a podcast. I mean, I say this all the time, but it's like you can't go to the bathroom anymore without doing something else, whether it's checking Instagram or sending a text or doing something like that. And I think even though this practice sounds so simple and like, duh, whatever, it's actually hard and it's really important. It's a muscle that you have to keep flexing and nature allows you this really easy opportunity to do that, which I think is really important. It is more it is more challenging for your mind to stay focused on one thing because it wants to wander and because it's easier to wander. So I think people just have to remember that when you your brain wants to move on to something else, you have to just remember that it's looking for the easiest next thing or the easiest way out and like pulling it back to one thing is harder, but allows you to to build that muscle. And it's kind of our responsibility for our brains and for our bodies. You know, once we realize how overstimulated and how hard it is, it's as important if you look at it as a muscle that you have to make sure it doesn't get weak, just like your body muscles, like it's it's so important. 100%. Yeah, that's my biggest thing. The mind muscle needs to always be on the focus. So and also easier said than done, right? Because I'm as addicted to my phone as the next person is. And I have to actively remember this morning, I was on my phone and my husband was like, why don't we go outside and stand in the sunshine for a minute and just like put our face to the sun? <laughs> turn to the side. That's the title of your book. But he was like, why don't we just go stand outside for a minute instead of drinking our coffee on our phones? And I was like, you know what, that's a great idea. Even though I hate you for suggesting this because I was enjoying my TikTok scroll. But I think that's super important. It is. It's the little things. It's the little changes, just like the little changes of, of seeing nature in different ways. Yes, totally. Now, your book is filled with such amazing plant life parallels and references, which is my favorite thing to talk about. One in particular that I think you would be so fun to jam on this concept with, but how many metaphors can we come up with for light? You have a whole chapter on light in your book, but if plants and nature have so much to teach us, what are different ways that we can approach this concept of light and light interacting with nature and darkness when exploring our own mindfulness? Yeah, I love light in general. I have a background in photography and I always look for light. This is an endless road, but in general, I think that when we're thinking about light, we can notice nature in the places where where plants interact with light. We're also plants need some darkness. You know, not all plants are full sun. Some plants need shade. And I think that also in our own lives too, sometimes we need to be in full sun and other times we need to be in shade either to recover or to process things. And I think that that's one aspect of light of how we can relate it to nature and our own lives. And also, I think that, like I named the book, like turn to the sun, because it's also like turn to what is good and hopeful and light isn't necessarily the physical, it can be people, it can be plants, it can be pets, something that is good and hopeful in your own life, and turning towards that as well as the light within you that is either shining bright in the moment or is waiting to shine. And I think that all these examples of seeing shade and bright sun, we can always bring ourselves into like, where am I in this moment? Do I feel like I'm in the sun? Am I kind of in the shade? Like, what stage am I in? Am I okay with it? Do I need to wait? Do I need to push myself forward? And turning to plants to see how they turn to the sun and how you need to too. So in a nutshell, that's my thoughts around that. But as I'm sure you have your own views and they're, they're endless. <laughs> uh, I love you, Brittany. I love how your mind works. And I feel like what I've just been thinking a lot about lately is the importance of the darkness and also how you know, there are some plants that only bloom at night in the darkness, right? Sometimes in order to get the bloom, you need to experience darkness and how important rest is. If you look at darkness as rest, you know, and light as productivity. I mean, there's so many different metaphors. But that's also why I'm like, gosh, whatever life thing you're going through right now, whether it's positive or negative, there is a plant life parallel. Like, I dare someone to find me a life circumstance that I cannot 
bring back to nature. And I think what you said is such a great example of that, because when we look at this plant relationship with light, it can be turning towards the sun, turning towards positivity. It could be assessing how much light positivity lives within you. It could be what's, you know, kind of season of light are you in, for lack of a better word, but are you in a bright space? Are you in a dark space? And also like learning to not stigmatize the darkness. Because I think some people feel like they have to be bright and sunny. I'm someone who struggles with this. You got to be bright and sunny all the time. But that's just like no one burns like that. No one burns that brightly 24 seven. And I think there's just so much to noodle on in there. Just even thinking like now, I mean, it's a beautiful sunny day in New York City, like no clouds. And that gives you so much energy. But some days, I mean, when it's cloudy here, it's like, all right. Like it also gives you a moment to be like, okay, I don't have to be out doing a million things. Cause there's always FOMO here. You know, it's the land of FOMO and it's like, Oh, like a rainy day is actually a great time to be like, okay, I'm going to allow myself to rest today. I don't need to be out doing a million things. So it's like leaning into those moments and you can have those kind of references as your guide. Yeah. You know, another like deep planty thought I've been thinking about, I want to bounce off of you. Mm-hmm is there's always present of light and dark. Because I've been thinking a lot about perspective lately. Any shitty thing that happens to you, you can choose to look at it through a positive lens or a, a dark lens. And even like when it's light here on the other side of the world, it's dark and vice versa. Like there's light somewhere at all times. When it's winter here, it's summer in Australia. Like there's always light available, even if it's not the easiest for you to grasp. And how do you allow yourself to like turn towards it? Once again, I'm just going to say the title of your book 100 (laughs) times in this conversation, which I'm not doing intentionally, but you picked a great title. You know, this concept of like, in every situation, or if you think about every situation is neutral, and then you know, you can take a perspective of it. There's that opportunity to find the, the light or the darkness, depending on what you need, kind of like what you just illustrated with the weather outside. It's very interesting. I don't know. What do you think? Is there something there? No, I love it. It makes total sense to me. And I always think about how, yeah, it's like it's like winter in the northern hemisphere. And in Brazil, they're partying on the beach in the summer. And it's like, whatever you're currently dealing with, there is another reality. So if, if it's, let's just, even we've just to talk about seasons, like if winter is a season where you don't feel as great, maybe you have, you know, feelings that just take you down by even reminding yourself, you know, half of the world is in summer. It's all that psychological switch from saying, well, I'm like in Brazil today, or I'm in Australia, like that, the whole mindset of knowing that there's, you know, that light somewhere else or that warmth somewhere else. And that can go into our daily lives and, and little things that happen or bigger things that happen. But yeah, your the whole perspective aspect. I am a, a fan and I believe in it. <laughs> I love it. It's like instead of the withering calathea on my bookshelf in the middle of winter in New York, I'm going to go be a monstera in Brazil soaking up (laughs) the sun and the party. Yeah, I'm going with you because that sounds uh, amazing. (laughs) Way more fun than all the snow that I'm under up here in upstate New York. (laughs) Yeah. Another interesting chapter of your book, and you know, you drew a lot of interesting connections between plants and compassion. Can you speak to how we can use plants as this tool to kind of practice that muscle of compassion as well? Yeah, I definitely think that compassion can be a tough one. And it's it's not something that maybe can come innately in certain situations. But when we connect to plants and nature, maybe we care for plants in our house, it allows us to see a different way of taking care of something. You know, maybe we have a plant that needs less water and if we're watering it too much and it's having some issues and it's like, okay, this, this plant needs a little less love and maybe seeing that certain situations need similar parallels too. And I think that, that having compassion for plants in our living world allows you to also have more compassion to our, for yourself. And I think that the path normally is if you have compassion for yourself, you're also able to give it to others. If you're able to give yourself grace, you're able to give it also to others. And I think that practicing this path with plants is a way to that place. So that's why I wanted to include the compassion aspect. And in the book, I write about this garden center where I grew up, there was like a little search and rescue table for plants and like 
and taking one home. Like they're the ones that haven't been doing that well, but it shows you that you can, they can recoup. And I think that it is a, a act of kindness in that way as well, that we can, that we get from, from taking care of plants. So big or small, I think it's a great way to start and, and also branch out your compassion to yourself and others. If you are looking to give your houseplants a little love this spring, you have to try Soltech Stylish Grow Lights. These lights are not just practical, but they're a sleek addition to any room, marrying a full-spectrum white light functionality that mimics the sun with a modern aesthetic. Soltech Grow Lights are designed to fit effortlessly into your living space, providing that essential light your plants need while enhancing your home's vibe. I have four Soltech Grow Lights in my tiny little office right now. I have their pendant-style aspect hanging light, in my closet. So I turned my closet into a grow room, basically, and I hung their light in my closet. The light bounces off the white walls of the closet. And I have 12 or 13 plants in my closet with that Soltech grow light. And then I have their Grove grow bars, their LED grow bars in my bookshelf. So I installed them in my bookshelf. And they have illuminated my bookshelf and they have made the coolest zoom background. My entire zoom background is filled with plants that are illuminated by their grow bars. With spring springing into action, it's a great opportunity to refresh your houseplants and give them a little boost. And to make it even more appealing, we have a special offer for you. The code BLOOM15, BLOOM15, gets you 15% off any of the lights at soltech.com. And these lights are an investment, so 15% will get you a long way. So that's BLOOM15 at soltech.com. You'll also enjoy free shipping within the U.S. and a reliable multi-year warranty. Each plant under a Soltech light not only thrives, but contributes to the natural calming environment, something we discuss in today's episode. So treat yourself to a Soltech light at Soltech.com and use code BLOOM15 at checkout. Yeah, compassion, empathy, like, I feel like especially in these times where our country, our world is divided on so many different issues. And it feels like it's getting harder and harder to understand that the people on the other side are human, like people just are filled with so much anger. I think we need those skills more than anything in in order to heal so many problems in the world. And um, I love that idea of every garden center has that little, you know, shelf that's all the discounted plants. And a lot of people gravitate towards them because they're cheap. They're like a dollar, you know, a couple dollars. But that thought of, no, I'm going to take you home and I'm going to nurse you back to health and I'm going to help and, you know, and I'm going to care for you. And, you know, I understand you're not you're not the best version of yourself right now, but we're going to get you there. I love that energy that you can bring towards plants. It's so beautiful. Yeah, I agree. And like that's that whole story was what made me want to write that specific, you know, chapter with um, compassion. And I think that, you know, people can take that example and use it in many ways, as you said, like connecting this with plants and nature. There's so many like life lessons that then you can relate to, to our daily lives. Yeah, totally. And also, I mean, with compassion too, sometimes I also feel like just this community, right? Like, you know, you and I met through a plant swap, I think. And, you know, we made this really great group of girlfriends that would get together and swap plants and hang out. And sometimes we didn't swap plants and we just go to brunch or, you know, whatever. I mean, compassion or connection maybe is is the better thing. But that's also such a fun residual side of this is just being able to like share your passion for plants with other people is so special, I think. And also, that's the perfect segue to your chapter on joy. Obviously, when I saw your chapter on joy, I was like, oh, yeah, let's talk about it. (laughs) What's your take on joy and adults? I feel like we're not accessing it as much as we should. I think for me, again, it goes back to the little things like we were talking about mindfulness with nature, we're noticing the little details in the natural world. I think joy for let's just say adults happens in the little unexpected moments. And it's not normally the big moments that we think it's going to be maybe those more moments are more awe filled maybe but like I think that joy comes from many of like the little tiny things that go on in our lives or little interactions and maybe the little interactions with nature but it's the unexpected and I think it's the things normally that we go back and realize sometimes oh that was joyful 
And it's not necessarily in the present moment that we know that we're experiencing joy, but we look back on and we realize that 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 was a moment to experience joy. And I can say for myself, like some of the community gardens in the East Village, Alphabet City, like they are a place where I always experience joy. And it's not saying, you know, there's not award-winning roses or other things. It's super quirky, the random plants, but it is in that like handmade nature of it that I always feel like it is endless joy and, and joy that stays with me. So that is like my prime example for like city life, especially with nature, it, those community gardens that are, that are not designed to be perfect. They're very human. And you meet the most interesting people in those community gardens. Oh my goodness. They are a cast. <laughs> they are a cast of characters. Some of my favorites. I can say though too, like with Joy, I mean, how when I was growing up, I wrote about how Joy was my grandma's favorite word and concept. And I learned from her that it is those little moments. It's the hard times that you get through and then you experience joy in things that can be even be mundane. And I have a pin that says joy that was hers. It was a Christmas pin. And it's, it's like my prized possession. You know, it's those little things that are don't have monetary value, but they're sentimental. And, you know, I don't think when I was a little kid, I realized like when she would say, she would say the word joy all the time. And we're like, yeah, we totally agree. But it's not until you get older and you have life experiences and you have things that go wrong or go right that you realize that I think I write in the book somewhere like joy is a choice. It's an attitude. And that's what she chose to be was joyous. And I think that that is is what then I've tried to do too, especially with nature. And obviously, you understand this very well. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that chapter and that beautiful tribute to your grandma. And it just it goes back to this discussion about perspective. And, you know, the fact that you do have to choose joy, I feel like that's such a cheesy but home goods or you know, at your TJ Maxx, like there's so many like cheesy signs that say choose joy and joys in script and chooses in big, but it's actually like a very deep statement. Like it's actually a calling. And it's so important. And I really resonate with what you said about, you know, as you get older, you realize how fleeting it can be and how important it is. I think, you know, since I had my melanoma diagnosis last year, and I had to get surgery, and I, you know, had to go deal with the C word and all of that kind of stuff. Like I look at the world so differently. Now, there are very few things that really can knock me off, like knock me out of my joy, because you just realize how I guess precious life is and also how you really do get to choose like you get to choose whether or not like my surgery day was insanely joyful because of the gratitude and the like, whatever I brought to it, or it could have just been like riddled with fear. I don't know why I'm running off on a tangent on that. But I did think about no, I mean, it's it's, it's a huge example, because you chose. And that is a huge choice. And also, when you choose that, I believe that it becomes just your way of life, then you chose that. And and you benefited from that choice and that attitude. And how could it not benefit you going forward when you've been through that hardest time? It has to be your biggest friend. Totally. That's a great, I love that, your biggest friend. It also makes me think of, I've heard from a lot of people in the community that in the pandemic, there was this huge surge to like buy all the plants and everybody has these huge collections. And now some people are going through a little bit of burnout. Maybe they've like killed a bunch of plants, maybe you know, their plant collections look look a bit different. And I think sometimes it's even just with plants, not to relate everything back to plants, but obviously that's what I'm going to do on this podcast. Sometimes I just think about my first Monstera cutting and the joy that that first fenestrated leaf unfurling brought me. I feel like I remember that <laughs> you talking about that. Yes, it was a week of celebration in my house. Like this Every freaking leaf that unfurled on this Monstera was like the most exciting, joyful thing. And then I got a couple more Monsteras, right? Now I have three huge Monsteras. They have epically fenestrated leaves, like whatever. And the other day I was sitting on the couch and Billy and I were just like hyping up one of my Monsteras because we were like, I can't believe how many holes are in the fenestrations because it's like sometimes you have to just go back to remember, oh, right, this is why I even got into this hobby and I can choose to continue celebrating all of these leaves, or I can completely be numbed out by 
the mundane, oh yeah, it's just another leaf on my monstera. Like that's totally my choice. And so, yeah, I think that's so interesting. How would you suggest a lot of people are struggling with anxiety right now? I know you're an expert in helping people work on decreasing their anxiety, increasing their joy, increasing their calm. How would you suggest people work with plants and nature to manage anxiety if they're in an anxious moment? So in general, stress and anxiety, there's an element of rumination that is associated with both. And when we ruminate, it allows for this tape just to continue in our mind and and it creates a worse scenario for these situations. But there's a bunch of science that shows that when people are engaged with nature, they ruminate less. So, and that's because we are more in the present moment and that tape that in your mind of either something that has gone wrong in the past or you're worrying about something in the future it press pause for a while and you're more in the present moment. And when you've spent time in nature, and then let's say you go back to whatever you were doing before, it takes longer for your brain than to catch back up. And in simple terms, it's basically like it has to get amped up again. So it takes longer for it to be like, okay, we were anxious. We were not happy. So creating that pause allows for a longer period where you can sustain this calm. So it becomes more of how like a controlled habit, as opposed to immediately coming back to that point where you're maybe feeling anxious or you're stressing about something. So that is kind of that concept of pause with plants when I originally started of that intentional pause in order to allow your brain to come back to the present moment. And I think that when you're taking care of plants or say you're out in a botanical garden or out in a community garden or a park, having those moments where you're engaging with nature, maybe again, you're looking at the details, you're just giving your brain a break and saying, you're going to take a little nap for a moment. We're going to embrace the present moment. And it's a great way to kind of lessen those feelings. And of course, they can come back. And this is a continual practice of noticing your feelings and kind of saying, oh, I'm feeling that certain way again. I know how this can go and saying, I'm going to take a moment. And maybe it's even in your mind, you're going to say, I'm going to take myself back to a natural scene that I like. This is a lot of times what I do with my clients. And we go back to maybe some place they like in nature and allowing that, that pause. So it's getting to know yourself, which we all know ourselves, but getting to know ourselves even better than before and saying we need that break and coming back to nature. Yeah. And I love this visualization you keep talking about because sometimes when we're in an anxious moment, we can't go to the local park. Like we're in the bathroom at work having a panic attack or we're feeling that anxious moment on the subway, you know, like where we don't have this access. So I love that you preach that you can kind of transport yourself there whenever you need. And sometimes it's even more restorative because you get to choose what's your favorite natural setting because it might be the beach, it might be, you know, it might be wherever it is. Yeah. And that might be far away, but it's not far away in your imagination. And even having those intentional practices will reduce adrenaline, cortisol. So you're getting the same benefits because at the same time, your brain can't determine what is real and what is imagined, which is what makes our mind so powerful and just, I mean, when I was an athlete and just like any other athlete now, like visualizing your performance or for you for performance and imagining you doing well and performing the way you want to, having your mind be trained for that success or for that calm, it goes back to that training that muscle. Yeah, totally. Well, I would love to ask for us to do a little meditation to wrap this up. But I have one more question before we do that. I loved your, you know, this concept of returning to the wild you know, especially as adults, we've got to be all like prim and proper and buttoned up and we're living in these urban environments and they're not wild, but this concept of letting yourself return to your wild. Can you speak to that a little bit in case anybody might want to explore this concept? Yeah, I think it it's it has a couple branches and and one is I think for you personally, like allowing yourself to be like, okay, like I'm a part of this broader ecosystem. I'm a part of the natural world. And let's say you live in a city, even going to a larger part and noticing the squirrels and animals that are there and engaging in different settings that 
aren't just our man-made world. And then if we go into like broader landscapes, like taking yourself on a weekend, either with a significant other friends and like going to some place like pretty dramatic, very much like, wow, this is the natural world of, of what would be here if our human world didn't exist. So there's that aspect too of, you know, perspective, as we talked about before, like what it looked like before and what we can still engage with. And then the other side of it too, is like we were talking about intentional thought in, in your imagination. So I live nowhere close to the rainforest, but I love the rainforest in Latin America. And when I am not there, which is most often, I like to remember how it is to be there. Remember being on the trails, noticing the plants, noticing the wildlife, and having that continual connection with these places that are important to us and that are truly wild compared to what our, our normal setting is. So I think it can be a variety of ways, but I think the concept of returning to the wild is also returning to not necessarily your wild side, not out of control, but your innate like vigor and your like some kind of animalistic attitude of just energy. So that chapter takes many turns, but I think in general, it is engaging with, with your wilder self, the wilder world at the same time. I love it. Before we dive into this meditation as a wrap up, please share the name of your book, where people can buy it and where people can find you in case they might want to coach with you. Yeah, absolutely. So the book is Turn to the Sun and you can find it on my website, brittanygowan.com or anywhere books are sold. And also on my website, you can check out my coaching for one-on-one -on -one or corporate. And also I'm on Instagram at Brittany Gowan. So I'd love to chat with anyone and that's where you can find me. Amazing. And talking about like noticing the little things, I love your stories because you often just have like one story tile or two story tiles of just a really interesting shot of nature in an urban setting. And I just as a follower enjoy looking at them. Thank you. I enjoy taking them. It's a nice like meditative practice of again, noticing like, oh, that's something different. So it's it's kind of always the challenge of like, what's next, even in a very familiar setting. Totally. Well, I would love to wrap up, you know, your book has all of these beautiful meditations. Every chapter has multiple meditations that people can read through, but they're really like poetry. They're very beautiful. I would love for you to kind of lead us out with a Brittany Gowan exclusive meditation for people to take a pause with plants. Awesome. It's my pleasure. So I picked one within the return to the wild uh, section, and it's called Awaiting Wildness. So imagine yourself standing at the foot of a nature trail. The path quickly turns to the right. You know little of what wilderness awaits you. Breathe in and out. Feel humbled by the opportunity to return to nature's home and eager to interact with the living world. Take a few steps on the trail. Greenery crowds in on both sides. Palm trees are abundant. Low branches reach down to meet the tallest leaves of plants stretching up from the ground. The vegetation is almost foreboding, but you realize returning to the wild requires you to trust the living world. You embrace its abundance and mystery. Pause and breathe in and out. Stand still and look ahead into the wild. Widespread leaves crisscross and lie flat next to each other. Plants and trees form green intersections. Follow the lines of stems and tree trunks. Watch how the scene, once complex and cluttered, begins to simplify. Continue to engage with the feeling of returning to the wild. Breathe in, pause, and breathe out. And when you are ready, return to where you are. And you know, that is one that I wrote based on a palm tree filled place that I've been to many years ago. And it has kept that setting alive for me. So um, it's special to share those moments that have impacted me and hopefully they can let other people venture off to those settings as well. That's so beautiful. And also you have such a relaxing voice and you also narrated your own audiobook. So people can go find your audiobook and have you read all these meditations to them. Yes, they don't even have to do it themselves. <laughs>
I know. I love it. Well, this has been such a wonderful excuse to reconnect with you, my long lost plant friend. Congratulations on all your success. Go check Brittany out at BrittanyGowan.com. And it's Brittany A-N-Y, not N-E-Y. A-N-Y. Yes. Yeah. A-N-Y. And um, until next time. Yes. Thank you so much. It was so nice to catch up and congrats on all of your success as well. Thank you so much to Brittany for this episode. Her book is so sweet. It's so giftable. It's beautifully designed. It's little. You could travel with it if you were going on vacation and wanted to read it. It's called Turn to the Sun. Go check it out. And you can also go check out Brittany on socials. We're going to have everything linked in the show notes. I hope this episode gave you some food for thought and maybe you can use one of the practices or rituals that we discussed to bring more joy in your life because this episode, along with all of the episodes on the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, are created in an effort to help you keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free, it's super fun, it takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're gonna get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle, inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.